policy recommendations cannot be made solely on the basis of either unproven theories or wishful thinking. Rather, what is required is a rational calculation based on a clear understanding of both historical precedent and American interests as they currently exist. When it comes to the problem faced that the U.S. faces by a nuclear-armed Iran, it is clear that the best option is one that clearly removes the threat posed by a nuclear-armed Iran, while at the same time upholding U.S. interests in the Middle East and limiting any potential negative consequences from an action that the U.S. might take. It is our opinion that a military strike represents this best option because of the following logic. Firstly, the United States has several core interests in the Middle East. American interests should be, at the, should be the most important consideration for any policy determination. There are many positive U.S. interests at play in regards to the Iranian nuclear program. Secondly, Iranian nuclear weapons profoundly threaten these interests in the Middle East. A nuclear-armed Iran will upset the delicate balance of power in the Middle East and bring instability and uncertainty to the region. U.S. interests depend on maintaining a favorable and stable balance of power in the Middle East. Thirdly, a military strike will successfully destroy Iran's nuclear program. Our projections show that a military strike has an extremely high probability of success in completely eliminating the Iranian nuclear program. This represents a much better alternative than other strategies which might allow the nuclear program to continue, thus continuing the threat into the future. Fourthly, Iran's reaction to a U.S. airstrike will be extremely limited, and its consequences will be minimal. Iran is left with few good options for retaliation following a U.S. strike, which means that the U.S. need only concern itself with the reactions from other regional or international actors, which, in turn, can also be limited. This is a list of primary U.S. interests in the Middle East. It is obviously not a comprehensive list, but it does a good job of showing what is at stake should Iran get a nuclear weapon. What all these interests have in common is one thing, namely stability and a continuation of the status quo in the Middle East. Most notably, the U.S. requires stability in the Middle East for one simple reason, to ensure continued access to Middle Eastern oil. This is an interest not just of the United States, but of the international community. While some might see the status quo in the Middle East as not being necessarily stable, it is clearly better than the alternatives. While a military strike may temporarily destabilize the Middle East, in the long term it will prove ultimately more stabilizing than other courses of action. Iran possessing a nuclear weapon threatens U.S. interests for a variety of reasons. Namely, from a common sense standpoint, the sheer fact of possessing nuclear weapons makes their use possible. Even should Iran not choose to use a nuclear weapon in an offensive nuclear war, the fact that they possess nuclear weapons allows them to threaten to do so, therefore increasing their power and influence in the Middle East and in the world. This will destabilize the region and pose a threat to U.S. regional allies. As well, there is no guarantee that a nuclear-armed Iran will act either in a rational or stabilizing manner. It is also probably unlikely that Iran will act in the interests of the United States. The knock-on effects of a nuclear-armed Iran are terrible. They will trigger regional shifts in power that are similarly undesirable and destabilizing. Finally, allowing Iran to get nuclear weapons allows them to portray the U.S. as weak and impotent on the international stage, while also allowing Iran to become more aggressive and belligerent in the region. If Iran attains a nuclear capability, there are many potential courses of action that it could take contrary to U.S. interests. Furthermore, regional actors will be forced to respond in a variety of ways to this newfound threat. Our goal will be to first clearly enunciate how both Iran and regional actors would respond to the acquisition of an Iranian nuclear weapon. We will then demonstrate how a military strike successfully prevents this pessimistic scenario from ever coming to pass. If Iran is allowed to continue its nuclear program, a strategy of deterrence will not be as easy or as straightforward for the United States to uphold as some might suggest. In acquiring a nuclear arsenal, Iran has failed to comply with the wishes of the international community and won. It now has coercive power that it did not previously possess and there is little incentive for Iran to give up that influence and act responsibly. In fact, there are rational incentives for Iran to act aggressively, should it attain nuclear capability, as it now has newfound means to change the status quo in the Middle East in its favor. An emboldened Iran has many negative consequences for the United States and for the rest of the world. Iran will undoubtedly seek 
to change the geostrategic makeup of the region to its advantage by using nuclear weapons to coerce other states. This is not in the United States' best interest, as, it, as we profit from there being no hegemon in the Middle East. We rely on the stability in the region to protect numerous American stakes, especially global economic stability. Moreover, could the United States actually deter Iran from using its nuclear weapons on other states in the Middle East? Even two rational actors like Iran and Israel, both in possession of relatively small nuclear arsenals, can be locked in a highly dangerous situation due to their long history of animosity. Because Iran will have so few, nucle so few nuclear arms, it might see this impasse as a use it or lose it situation, or as an opportunity to engage Israel in more smaller scale conflicts, backed with the possibility of nuclear escalation. Even if it is unlikely that Iran will use its nuclear weapons offensively, its complicated political calculus breeds enough doubt surrounding Iran's, the, uh, the state's intentions for us to be concerned. Iran's interests are nevertheless at odds with American interests, and it is better to remove all uncertainty in the aftermath of a nuclear Iran than for the U.S. to allow its program to continue. We have reasons to believe that Iran may not be as risk-averse as other nuclear states as it calculates costs differently. Iran operates under a complicated and interlocking system of government, largely influenced by religious and cultural ideologies. Based on its current political calculus, there is great uncertainty surrounding how the Iranian regime will lead the state once it has nuclear capabilities. Iran is a neo-sultanate, single-voice society. Article 57 of the Iranian Constitution grants the supreme leader absolute authority over the legislative, the judiciary, and the executive powers. Furthermore, the Ayatollah, a position Khomeini has occupied for the past two decades, is not popularly elected, but rather appointed by an assembly of experts. Ultimately, Iran's interlocking government structure makes it unclear who will control the decision to employ its nuclear arsenal. Those that argue more nuclear weapons create a safer world are overly optimistic in their calculation of how a nuclear armed state will behave. It is unlikely that Iran will be a responsible actor um, because it has already defied the international community cries against it becoming a nuclear power and succeeded. And it now has the ability to experiment and figure out how much coercive leverage this new capability can procure. Rational deterrence theory assumes that all states prescribe to a similar thought process. It does not account for the idiosyncrasies of each actor in the nuclear scheme of things. The theory has no diagnostics, failing to explain how statesmen are to determine another state's intentions. In practice, it is very difficult to know another state's objectives, true objectives, and make the requisite calculations. By that logic, there is great unpredictability surrounding how the Iranian regime will move forward. Furthermore, if the other state seeks, seeks mainly security, which Iran is currently claiming it needs its nuclear arsenal for, then deterrence can fail as the escalation of conflict spirals. Iran will see an American policy of deterrence, Pakistan possibly putting nuclear weapons in Saudi Arabia, a very likely consequence of Iran attaining its nuclear arsenal, and a nuclear Israel to its left, all as rational incentives to act in an aggressive manner to protect its nuclear program and its regime from foreign attack. Iran could cite their seemingly combative stance as merely taking steps for security's sake. Ahmadinejad said that whoever were to control the Middle East's oil and wealth and is more like, is who, Ahmadinejad said that whoever were to control the Middle East's controls the world's energy and wealth, and whoever dominates the Middle East is more likely to control the entire world too. It's much more realistic that a nuclear Iran will protect its power through intimidation and blackmail. Iran will seek to reduce US presence in the region so it can attempt hegemony. In attaining that position, Iran will be able to set the world's oil market prices, increase support for terrorist groups and non-state proxies like Hamas and Hezbollah, and oppose any possibility for an Israeli-Palestinian peace agreement. A nuclear Iran is good for Iran, but terrible for everyone else. Iran will appear technologically and militarily advanced, though that might not actually be the case, and be able to use the threat of employing nuclear weapons in order to get its way. Iran might also look to extend its nuclear umbrella, much like Pakistan is looking to do in Saudi Arabia, and a nuclear Iran 
a nuclear-armed Iran is more likely to engage in conventional warfare and win against non-nuclear states. With more nuclear weapons comes greater responsibilities for states to take on. Even Kenneth Waltz, an ardent supporter of RDT, says that more nuclear weapons can be, uh, creates an environment where nuclear weapons can be set off accidentally, anonymously used to back a policy of blackmail, or be used in a conventional nuclear attack. Iran's interlocking system of government makes it difficult to predict who will ensure control of the weapons and who will ensure control of the decision to use them. Iran is more likely to operate alongside the organizational theory, maintaining a high readiness for war and less likely to be constrained by safety-conscious civilian authorities. However, regardless of the actions a nuclear Iran might take, the reactions of other states in the region will generate much uncertainty and instability. A nuclear Iran poses an incredible security threat to Iran's regional actors. States like Turkey, Egypt, and many of the nations in the Gulf Cooperation Council fear the regional hegemonic status that Iran will reach if it acquires a nuclear weapon. These fears are largely due to Iran's past attempts at violently exporting its Shia ideologies on the largely Sunni populations of the region. If Iran obtains nuclear weapons, states in the region will likely pursue one of two courses of action. They will either uh, choose to obtain nuclear weapons themselves, or will choose to bandwagon with Iran or other nuclear powers. Saudi Arabia has regarded Iran as its primary regional threat for the past three decades. In 1979, as part of the Islamic Revolution, Iran encouraged Saudi Shias to rise up and violently export their, their ideology throughout the nation. This proved to be problematic for Saudi Arabia because the Shia populations were largely located in the critical bulk oil reserves of the region. This therefore posed an incredible thought, uh, threat to the Saudi Arabian economy, government structure, and culture. From this time, intense anti-Iranian sentiment was deeply ingrained in Saudi Arabian minds, and this sentiment has only been in further amplified due to Iranian terrorism within Saudi Arabia. Some examples of this terrorism are the Kobar Tower bombings and the plotted assassination of the Saudi ambassador to the United States. Therefore, if Iran nuclearizes, Saudi Arabia will regard this action as a direct threat to its national interests and will nuclearize itself. The nation will be able to obtain nuclear weapons relatively quickly and easily through its solidified alliance with Pakistan. If Saudi Arabia does choose to nuclearize, some may assert that Iran and Saudi Arabia will be rationally deterred from attacking one another. Though balancing may seem like the likely outcome of a bipolar nuclear Middle East, due to deep-seated mistrust and intense hostile rivalry among the nations, the stability-instability paradox is likely to occur. The stability-instability paradox is the theory that when two states have nuclear weapons, they are very unlikely to engage in large-scale conflict due to fear of larger nuclear warfare as well as mutually assured destruction. Though large-scale conflict is very unlikely to occur, smaller-scale conflict becomes all the more likely because states are more ready to pursue smaller conflicts to prevent them from escalating into larger or more dangerous conflicts. India and Pakistan are currently locked in the, in the stability-instability paradox due to their deep-seated state tensions that were present even before their acquisition of nuclear weapons. India and Pakistan have reached the brink of nuclear warfare and still continue to fight and launch terrorist attacks on one another. Therefore, Saudi Arabia and Iran will mirror this incredibly dangerous relationship and will only perpetuate the hatred coming from both sides. As for other regional actors, it is largely unclear how other states will respond to a nuclear Iran. The Gulf Cooperation Council, Turkey, and Egypt have all cited a nuclear Iran as a direct threat to their national interests. A nuclear Iran will likely flex its big power capabilities to bully other nations in its desire to export its Shia ideologies. The Gulf Cooperation Council has vocally opposed a nuclear Iran. However, within the Gulf Cooperation Council, some nations, like Oman and Qatar, have better relationships with Iran than others, like Saudi Arabia and Bahrain. Therefore, a nuclear Iran could cause a divide among the Gulf Cooperation Council that could lead to unrest throughout the region. If multiple states in the Middle East were to nuclearize, some may assert that the states will naturally balance and deter one another from using their nuclear capabilities. This, however, is an oversimplified view of a nuclear Middle East due to the geopolitical dynamics of the region. 
The beginning stages of nuclear prol proliferation will create a period of instability that will je jeopardize the status quo of the Middle East. This is because the new nuclear states will possess small arsenals and will be located in a geographically constrained region defined by intense rivalries and complicated alliance systems. Countries with new nuclear capabilities may have rational incentives to take advantage of other states without second strike capabilities, thus leading to interest damaging unrest throughout the region. The key here is the uncertainty of the actions of other regional actors. Uncertainty is our worst enemy regarding nuclear weapons in the, in the Middle East because it will further destabilize the region through decisions driven by fear of Iranian hegemony, Saudi Arabian hegemony, or the rise of other nuclear powers. Maintaining stability in the region is in our best interest, and by taking mil military action against a nuclear Iran, the environment of the Middle East is in the control of the United States. Uh, as we have seen, a nuclear Iran poses many threats to the U.S. interests. A uh, military strike is the best option uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, the U.S. knows the location of the four facilities uh, that have, has the nuclear program. Uh, secondly, we can bomb them successfully. We foresee high projection or high probabilities of success. Uh, thirdly, Iran's uh, air defense is weak, so there will likely be no U.S. military casualties. And uh, finally, the response to a U.S. bombing would likely be limited, and uh, we can contain Iran's responses. Uh, so these uh, are the four uh, sites that we need to bomb. Uh, Esfahan, which is a uranium conversion facility, Iraq, which is a heavy water production plant, uh, and Natanz and Fordow, which are both fuel enrichment plants uh, with centrifuges inside of them. Uh, Natanz and Fordow are both fortified. Uh, Fordow, uh, in particular, is basically under a mountain. Uh, so these percentages you see on the board uh, were done by two respected scholars, uh, but these are in regard to Israel's Air Force, not the U.S.'s. Uh, so you might be worried about those low percentage uh, chances of success for the two four to five facilities, uh, but we believe that they will be much higher for the U.S. Uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, one is uh, the U.S. possesses this new bomb called the Massive Ordnance Penetrator. Uh, it's a massive new bomb. It's 30,000 pounds, uh, 5,000 pounds of high explosives, and it can penetrate through 200 feet of reinforced concrete. Uh, so if one doesn't do it on Fort Dow, two definitely will. Uh, in addition, the U.S. has uh, three aircraft carriers in the region currently so that we could provide much air support for, uh, for our bombers going in. Uh, right here, this is the actual massive ordnance penetrator. It makes big explosions. <coughs> uh, and uh, finally, Iran's air defense uh, is extremely weak. They have no integrated air defense system. Uh, their planes and their uh, missiles are hodgepodge from a bunch of different countries. Uh, and they're missing a lot of parts currently. They haven't been able to make repairs uh, due to arms embargoes. So again, uh, we predict a high probability of success for a military strike on Iran's four nuclear facilities. Uh, so uh, we recommend uh, doing a limited one-time strike on the four facilities uh, using the massive ordnance penetrators as well as uh, tactical uh, precision bombs in order to make the strike as surgical as possible. Um, uh, right after that, we want to issue a statement to Iran letting them know that we're not uh, after regime change. We're only trying to get rid of their nuclear program. Uh, we don't want the Mullahs to be concerned that we're trying to overthrow them. Uh, we're just after the nuclear, their nuclear facilities. Uh, finally, we want to have a global PR campaign uh, trying to mitigate some of the international backlash uh, that will be raised against the U.S. Uh, we want to tell the world why we did what we did, uh, try to justify our, our, um, our decision a little bit. Um, so following a, uh, a U.S. strike, the Iran, Iran has a number of options that they can pursue uh, in response. As you can see, there's a whole host of military options. Uh, we think those are unlikely. Uh, Iran has rational incentives to not pursue a, uh, a military response uh, because in the event that it escalates, uh, Iran knows that the U.S. will be able to destroy its, its military, uh, and they don't want that. So we think it is more likely uh, that they will either do no response or try to appeal to the international community. Uh, we believe that the international backlash, while uh, concerning, uh, does not outweigh the, uh, the benefits of a non-nuclear Iran. Uh, and if they do choose to act militarily anyway, uh, by attacking Saudi oil facilities, uh, attacking Israel through its proxies, such as Hamas, Hezbollah, uh, or using attacking small-scale forces, small-scale attacks on US forces, uh, we can contain all of these. Uh, they're not that big of a deal. We can, they're, they're concerning, but we can contain them. Uh, a perhaps more concerning option for retaliation is closing the Strait of Hormuz. 
Uh, the Stratoform moves is the world's uh, most important, important uh, naval chokehold for uh, oil shipping. 20% it, it, of the world's oil comes through there. Uh, however, again, there are rational incentives for Iran not to close the Stratoform moves. Uh, much of the oil that ships out of there uh, goes to Asia. China, in particular, gets around 40% of its oil through the Strait. Uh, so there will be heavy diplomatic pressure uh, from China, from uh, Japan, uh, to, to, for Iran not to, close the, uh, <clears throat> not to close the Strait, especially if they're trying to uh, garner international support for their cause. Uh, closing the Strait is an act that harms indiscriminately, uh, and that would not help them. Uh, furthermore, they'd be essentially shooting themselves in the foot. Uh, they get 50% of their revenue uh, from oil sales through the Strait of Hormuz. Uh, so we think it's likely that they won't. However, if they do, uh, it could be potentially disruptive to the world oil market. Uh, but we believe that they don't have the capabilities to close it for any extended period of time. Uh, there have been different estimates. Um, we think at like absolute worst case scenario, one to two weeks, most likely a high probability that they can't close that at all. Close that at all. If they do, uh, oil prices will uh, go up temporarily, uh, but it will be a short period of uh, spikes, uh, and it can be supplemented by Saudi oil reserves that can be shipped through pipelines. Uh, so finally, uh, uh, the long-term effects of a uh, bombing of bombing of Iran's nuclear program. Uh, they have three options of what they can do afterwards. They can rebuild above ground, uh, rebuild secretly underground, or cease their program. Uh, in the two precedents uh, for a similar attack, uh, when Israel preemptively struck Iraq in '81 and Syria in '07, uh, and neither of those countries ever regained the capabilities that they had before they were struck. Um, so we believe that a strike in Iran would limit them to at least, uh, I mean, would prevent, put them back at least 10 years, most likely more, potentially forever. Uh, there's a couple reasons for this. Uh, they would be fighting an extremely uphill battle. They would have to, in rebuilding their operation, they'd have to be operating in complete secrecy, uh, and they would literally have to go like very far underground in order to protect themselves from future bombings. Uh, they would have to, it would be a huge capital investment, and they would have to get the equipment that they, uh, aren't really capable of producing. So it's unclear where they would get that. Uh, and then centrifuging uranium just takes a long time. Uh, and at the same time, they would likely have to be uh, increasing their air force in order to protect against future attacks. Uh, so we see at least 10 years, most likely more, uh, this would set back Iran's nuclear program. Uh, and as we'll see, this is a much better option uh, than the alternative. One strategy that, it, that has been floated as a potential alternative to military strike is the idea that the U.S. can enforce a containment regime in the Middle East that will deter Iran should they get a nuclear weapon. It is our opinion that this is a very bad and risky idea for the U.S. to try for a variety of reasons. In the first place, a containment regime allows Iran to attain a nuclear capability and furthermore will allow their, nu their nuclear program to continue producing nuclear weapons. As well, a containment regime requires a long-term U.S. military commitment to the Middle East that will destabilize the region even further and serve as a constant irritant both to Iran and other nations in the Middle East. Furthermore, a containment regime is extremely costly, both militarily, morally, and fiscally. As a point of comparison, in an attempt to contain Saddam Hussein's Iraq from 1996 to 2001, the United States spent $5.6 billion attempting to contain him. Saddam Hussein did not have nuclear weapons. Our estimates for baseline costs for the military strike are much lower, approximately $50 million. While some might argue that the cost of containing Iran will be less because they have nuclear weapons and therefore we don't need a military alternative, this will not be the case. Iran is much larger than Iraq. It has a much stronger economy. Therefore, the costs are more likely to be greater than they were in trying to contain Saddam Hussein. Militarily, the U.S. does not necessarily possess the resources at this current time to successfully enforce a containment regime. A containment regime would require a large-scale increase of U.S. troops in the region as the U.S. military is thinly stretched trying to wind down wars in both Iraq and Afghanistan. Morally, it is difficult to target a containment regime such that it doesn't negatively affect the lives of civilians and non-combatants at the same time as it targets policymakers and belligerents. This will radically decrease the U.S. standing on the world stage in much, in much greater ways than a military strike would. In conclusion, we believe that a military strike is the best option to deal with the Iranian nuclear program because it removes, potentially and likely permanently, 
the threat posed by an Iranian nuclear weapon. Even in the worst case scenario, we delay the Iranian nuclear program at a minimum of 10 years, which is huge because a lot can happen in 10 years, both internally in Iran and in the Middle East in general. Namely, within Iran, many things could happen. There could be domestic political upheaval and change, including the dismantling of the current religiously led regime. As well, there could be a change in the Iranian political calculus, such that they don't believe that pursuing nuclear weapons is necessary for their security or stability. Rather than an open-ended, long-term commitment of US military forces to the Middle East to enforce a containment regime, a military strike would both be quick, effective, and relatively inexpensive. Given the limited consequences of a military strike against Iran, it is clearly the best option to remove this incredibly grave threat to the United States once and for all. Thank you very much. We will now open it up to questions from our team. Or our team. Who'd like to get us started? Michael? Uh, well, first of all, let me say that was an excellent presentation. You guys uh, are all fantastic public speakers, and I thought the slides were very impressive, especially the video footage of the massive ordnance penetrator. <laughs> um, but I, I can't help feeling that you know it's usually the better the commercial, the crappier the product. And I feel like what you're trying to sell <laughs> is a really bad product. In particular, uh, you're arguing against deterrence, which currently has a perfect batting average. Uh, there haven't been any failures, and so I'm wondering why Iran is different than any other case of a crazy regime that has had nuclear weapons that's been deterred. You've got to argue, why are they different than Mao in China? The guy stopped brushing his teeth halfway through his life, and his teeth all turned black because he thought it would disrupt his uh, inner harmony. Uh, Khrushchev took his shoe off, banged it on a table, and said, we're going to bury you, uh, Kim Jong-il. And then you have India and Pakistan, two uh, countries that absolutely despise each other, have fought many wars, and yet all of these countries have been deterred. So why is Iran different? I think those are some interesting historic analogies to consider, but I think the specifics of this case mean that they are unlikely to be applicable and we are unlikely to see those results. As we said, the Iranian political calculus, I think, works in very different ways from either communist Soviet Union or China. I think there are Shia ideologies at play and religious connotations that were not present in either of those other two cases. While we are obviously not arguing that Iran is a, some sort of crazy, irrational, radical regime, the fact of the matter that, is that these need to be taken into account. Furthermore, I think you see also many examples of regimes that we try to successfully deter and have been unsuccessful, such as in North Korea. Furthermore, containment regimes in Iraq left us with such uncertainty that we eventually had to reinvade Iraq in 2003 precisely because the containment regime we were unsure of whether it was successful or not and therefore had to embark upon a very, a very expensive and long-term military commitment. Given these alternatives, we think it is best to eliminate the program immediately at the start and therefore remove the threat permanently. John, okay. Um I tend to just buy whatever commercials tell me to buy. So, uh, uh, no, that was a very, very powerful presentation. Um, I, I'm going to push you a bit on um, the relationship between kind of diplomacy and then the surgical strike. So, I want you to imagine Hillary Clinton traveling around the region and saying, okay, here's our plan. We're going to launch a surgical strike. We're going to knock out the four facilities, and, um, and then we're basically going to leave the region. Um, uh, so, you know, we don't expect Iran to retaliate, but um, you're kind of on your own um, if they do. I, I would imagine that there might be some reservations. And what I'm getting at is I don't think our allies are going to consent to a surgical strike. My suspicion is they'll want us to take out any Iranian capability that might be used to retaliate against them. And once we start doing that, it turns into a much bigger conflict than you're talking about. So I just want you to maybe speculate a bit about um, how we're going to sell this to our allies so that you can have the kind of surgical strike that you want. Uh, well, I mean, I think there are, there are strong incentives, first of all, for Iran not to retaliate. Uh, and we wouldn't be removing all our troops uh, from the region. We would still have troops within the Middle East. Uh, and we can also, uh, if taking that into mind, we could potentially uh, issue a statement after the bombing uh, letting our allies know that we will uh, protect them in the case of retaliation. Now, isn't that kind of what a containment regime would look like then? Uh, minus the nuclear bombs. 
I mean, I mean further, further, furthermore, a, a containment regime is obviously going to require more troops in the Middle East than we currently have. Well, we're not necessarily advocating that we pull all our troops out of the Middle East. We're saying you can keep it at levels that it are now and not necessarily increase. So therefore, we would not be accruing additional costs based upon a large-scale containment regime. Rather, we'll be able to keep, keep our troop levels at, at the place that they are now and similarly depend upon the clear rational incentives that Iran has for not escalating the conflict. Iran has embarked upon a very dangerous game of political brinksmanship. We feel that once we call their bluff, essentially, destroy their nuclear program, they have lost their trump card and therefore do not want, will not be inclined to retaliate. We think they will try to appeal to the international community, at which point any sort of retaliation just destroys any credibility that they have. President Paul. So, um, not every planned military action goes exactly according to how it was drawn up on the board. So. I'm curious for you to uh, gain out a scenario where we do engage in such a strike. We destroy one and a half, maybe two of the facilities. Three of our planes are shot down and uh, pilots captured and held by the Iranian regime. Let's talk a little bit about what that possibility, which I think is a definite possibility, would look like going forward with our uh, strategy in the region. I mean, I think that's a possibility. At the same time, our projections show that it is a very unlikely possibility. Our percentages of success in destroying all facilities are very high, all of them above 90%. Iran's um, air defense systems are extremely weak, old, so therefore we don't believe this high possibility. Obviously, should it happen, it will be extremely costly for the United States, but those are the costs that we will just have to bear in order to ensure that Iran does not gain a nuclear weapon and therefore does not be able to threaten the United States further on down the road. If we are to fail to destroy Iran's nuclear program in the first strike, obviously we will have to authorize a second strike, which might prove more costly. But once again, it is a better alternative than allowing Iran to continue with their nuclear program. Jeff Lagarde. Um, I was um, interested in a couple different issues. One is I, I read a lot um, about fracking in the U.S. And fracking, they say, resolves our oil problems. And if it resolves our oil problems, why do we care about the Middle East? It seemed to me that was your main, your main point was oil. That was our main interest in the Middle East. Why should we go in and attack Iran? Why not let China or Europe, isn't it their problem? Your focus was on US national interests. Uh, you might argue, well, the international economy is dependent on it, but you know, China can frack too, and they can get oil from Siberia. Um, it's just not clear what the the upside advantage of that is. The other thing I was struck by is that you wanted to argue Iran is irrational when it came to nuclear weapons, but would be rational when it came to military responses to U.S. military action. I was wanted to know how you could reconcile those two different views. Uh, on the irrational versus irrational irrationality, uh, we uh, we're basing our attack list on the the threat to new, uh, U.S. interests on the, on the presumption that they are rational. Uh, the irrationality uh, we we don't necessarily think it will hold, but we can't ignore it. We think there is a possibility. Uh, however, the, the calculations of threats to U.S. interests are based on uh, Iranian rationality. And uh, on yeah. the fracking, I don't know anything about yeah. fracking. Yeah, I mean, in regards, we're not arguing that Iran is an irrational actor. Rather, we're saying their political calculus is such that it's very complicated and very different from the political calculus either of the United States or the previous examples of nuclear deterrence. This is a diagram of Iran's governmental structure. It is completely interlocking with many unelected institutions which have a religious bent to them. And so, therefore, given that alternative, we think that we can't necessarily Why trust their really action. Why is religious bent going to kick in on the conventional response to any U.S. military action? It might. And if it does, I think that just proves the danger of allowing them to have nuclear weapons in the first place. But your argument is based on the rationality of it being there would be a minimal uh, military response. The cost wouldn't be that high. I, I mean, I mean, I, I agree with what you're saying. You're saying that if we're saying that they're going to be rash, they were saying they're going to be rational in terms of nuclear deterrence, then they should be rational in terms of conventional deterrence and not want to escalate. 
if you, or if we're going to argue that they're irrational when you use nuclear weapons, that they're going to be irrational in their military response. We would argue that they would both be rational and rational rather than irrational and irrational. Obviously, if they are irrational in the first and irrational in the second, that is a very dangerous scenario that I think we have to try and limit the cost. But if they are going to be irrational in the response to a conventional military strike, then I think that makes it very, very dangerous to allow them to have nuclear capabilities and be able to use them potentially irrationally. Um, in response to the fracking question, I think, obviously, yes, if the U.S. can achieve energy independence, then our interest in the Middle East are greatly decreased. At the same time, however, that doesn't necessarily mean we can abandon the region, especially allowing Iran to gain a nuclear weapon and potentially become a regional hegemon. As we have seen, Iran has become increasingly aggressive and outward-looking in um, their attempted actions, both in the United States, such as their plot to assassinate the Saudi ambassador, and also recently a report just came out of the capture of two Iranian Republican Guard operatives in Kenya with explosives trying to target both U.S., Saudi, Israeli, and British facilities there. Now you could argue that this goes one of two ways. Either Iran is feeling very threatened and so therefore is lashing out in unpredictable manners, or you could argue that Iran is becoming emboldened because of the fact that the U.S. has been unable to stop their nuclear program, they feel that they can extend their reach internationally. We would argue the latter, that if Iraq gained a nuclear capability, became emboldened, seen, saw the U.S. as weak and impotent in withdrawing from the Middle East, I think that is a much more dangerous scenario for the U.S., allowing Iran to potentially come and attack us at home rather than in the Middle East. Now yeah, open it up to uh, the rest of our audience. Florida's? You guys want to? Um, Go ahead. You guys have taken a very antagonistic stance, and um, right now it seems to me that the world is actually, for U.S. security interests, the world is actually relatively stable. Um, how do you, how do you like compromise with the fact that your stance will most likely incur really like a lot of backlash, potentially non-security or a a political backlash, which is much harder than a regime. It's much harder to attack a regime. Like putting troops in Saudi Arabia inspired a lot of people to take action. What, mm -hmm. would, what would military strikes in Iran do? I mean, we understand that a nuclear strike, uh, sorry, a strike on Iran's nuclear facilities will create, you know, some backlash on us, but we are willing to risk destabilizing the region temporarily for stability in the long run. There will be stability in the long term because of the predicted high success rate of eliminating the nuclear program and eliminating Iran's uh, desire for nuclear weapons. Um, in terms of the political backlash, Iran-Iraq war, no one really cared about it after a few months. I mean, you know, there isn't, uh, I mean, people care about things when they're happening, but do you know what's going on in Libya right now? Do you know what's going on in Egypt? I, I mean, things were pretty heated, you know, a few months ago, but now it's kind of gone to the back of people's minds, and now it's Syria that's happening, you know? So I think in terms of uh, international response, I think that it'll be limited and it'll be short term. I think, uh, furthermore, your point about U.S. troops in Saudi Arabia is a very good one in proving why containment is not necessarily a political feasible option. If you look, I'm going to show you referring to the US, U.S. troops in Saudi Arabia prior to the Gulf War. That was one of the main reasons that Osama bin Laden used his justification for the attack on the United States. His justifications were stationing of U.S. troops in, in Saudi Arabia, the death of Iraqi civilians following the containment regime, and there were a couple more that were not nearly as related. So therefore, I think a containment regime is actually more dangerous as a potential recruitment tool, both for terrorism and for backlash internationally, because of the fact that it targets civilians. It is impossible to target containment regimes solely that it impacts decision makers. So therefore, I think the potential negative consequences of containment regime are as much, if not greater, than military strike in terms of political backlash. Paul. Yeah, you talked a lot about sort of the nuclear uh, Iran in general, but not that much about what Iran would actually possess were it to go nuclear, nor much about the time frame in which it could go nuclear. Iran clearly has a lot of technical hurdles that still has to jump. It has enough low enriched uranium for roughly five devices, but it would have to enrich that highly enriched uranium. That takes some time. Then it would have to design an implosion device. That would take some time. Then it would have to test a weapon. That would take some time. Then we have to find a delivery vehicle. We have to uh, modify the weapons so they're small enough to say fit on the nose cone of a missile. And even under an optimistic scenario, it would have say two to three devices that it might credibly be able to deliver on some target somewhere in the region. Do you think Iran's really going to run short-term risks 
and have a very adventurous foreign policy simply because it has two to three highly unreliable weapons that it may get in five to ten years. I mean, I think I agree that, I mean, you describe it, you describe it well. At the same time, however, at what point then is the U.S. going to act? I think the, diff, the danger is that if we allow Iran to say, oh, they're, they're not going to get it for a little while, oh, it's going to be very difficult to get them, then they have them and we can't launch a nuclear strike because they have the capability. Obviously, yes, it's going to be risky. Should Iran, should Iran fire a nuclear weapon and it doesn't go off? Obviously, the world is saved. But are you willing to bet on that outcome? Are you willing to bet on the fact that Iran only has five and four of them kind of malfunction, but one lands in Israel? I think that's a very risky scenario. So therefore, we need to prevent it. Brendan. So uh, I'd like to congratulate you on a great presentation. Uh, you know, I actually think you probably made this argument better than anybody in the public debate makes it. Uh, so, so you're to be congratulated. Uh, you know, what I always worry about uh, when I think about this uh, is the kind of incentives it's going to give to American decision makers. Uh, which is that, you know, there was a time, you know, before basically when the Cold War was ending when America more or less minded its own business in the Middle East. Uh, and then we won this glorious victory in 1991 that no one expected. Uh, and it basically convinced us that our job was to run the Middle East. Uh, and since then, we had this devastating containment regime that you talked about so eloquently, which then convinced us to launch an even stupider war in Iraq. Uh, you know, we continued, I think, to probably uh, overly push the interests of some of our allies in the region to the detriment of American national interests and, and the threat of terrorism. Uh, and if this military strike goes as well as you think it's going to go, isn't this going to just convince American decision makers that we are absolutely correct to be running the Middle East? And if that means intervening in the situations X, Y, and Z, well, then good for us. Isn't this just a recipe for further costly interventions down the line uh, that will cause real problems for American troops? for American fiscal budgets, uh, and for the American strategic position overall. In short, wouldn't this be something akin to a Pyrrhic victory, which is that we might eliminate the very real threats that you say uh, exist from a nuclear Iran, but we might only continue the even realer threats that exist from our own overreach in the world that we've been suffering from for the past 10 years or so? I mean, I feel like there's already been a precedent set of this, and uh, a strike of the nature that we're advocating uh, might set a new precedent for uh, less costly intervention. Uh, things that don't harm American troops that don't cost as much. Uh, so I think the, the thing about American policymakers, kind of, that, that's already happens. Like we are, and this sets a new precedent for better ways to intervene. Um, to add on, I just think that each case has to be examined individually. So we don't have, you know, a set precedence for, let's say, like humanitarian intervention. We examine each case as it comes, and if it threatens American interests at the time, then we have, you know, the responsibility responsibility for the rest of the world to do something about it. And this directly affects American interests, and it harms us and the rest of the world in very many ways. What? Um, I'm wondering, uh, since Israel's uh, military capabilities and uh, chance of success in attack are low, would you include Israel in a military response against Iran, since uh, Israel is our um, perhaps main ally in, in, in the, the Middle Eastern region? Would you include them in, how would you include Israel? Would, would you include them in the strike? Would you include them in the aftermath in, in containing Iran? It's Where would Israel? Israel where would Israel, where would Israel, the ally that we're trying to pr prevent Iran from attacking, supposedly, uh, where would I Israel's commitment come into? Uh, they would, they would not be included in the strike, and uh, I'm, I'm assuming if they got attacked, uh, perhaps in response, uh, they would defend themselves. I mean, I think it's crucial. We, we, if we, one of the things that I think we didn't necessarily bring up in as much detail is the idea that if the U.S. doesn't necessarily launch a military strike, Israel will. And we think that that is a much more dangerous scenario because Iran has a much likelier, um, more, much more incentives to attack Israel than it is to go after the United States. And so therefore, we think it is much better for the U.S. to launch a strike because the U.S. can't take the, can't take the brunt of the political backlash. It can take, accept some costs, even as we say that they will be low, whereas Israel might not necessarily be able to do so. Maybe uh, one or two more questions, but I'll, I'll take this opportunity to ask my own. Um, you, you set out a theoretical case for taking out Iran's nuclear program. What about a timeline? Do you envision setting conditions, telling Iran they uh, face uh, a risk of uh, 
attack in the near term future? Do you see this as a bolt out of the blue? Have you given any thought to uh, when this should happen? According to your analysis, we should do this tomorrow. <coughs> do you recommend doing this tomorrow or after a setting of conditions? How might you en envision the strike actually taking place? I would not say tomorrow, but I would say sooner rather than later. Because the problem with setting red lines or setting conditions that Iran, if they break, we will action, is it allows Iran to continue with their program and allows them to, prote to prepare for what we may do in the future. So therefore, yes, it will have to be a bowl of blue, it will have to be a surprise attack. That gives us the best chances of success. And I think waiting allows them to get even closer to getting a nuclear weapon, allows them to strengthen the air defenses, allows them to do more things contrary to the U.S. interests in the region. So therefore, yes, it should be sooner rather than later. Tomorrow, that's probably a little too soon. I think we should plan and make sure we have clear contingencies on how to contain the negative effects and make sure that we are successful. But as soon as we have those plans in place, I think we go after them. One final question. Hamza. So um, you talked about what could happen possibly in 10 years after the strike. And you're talking about a U.S. strike on Iran and how the public opinion might change after that. So do you think, do you think that the public opinion could possibly move to a favorable one for the religious regime? because? they see U.S. as a threat and because this regime is fighting against the U.S. And wouldn't their um, allies, like for example Hamas, step up their aggression against states like Israel? Uh, well, in regards to the Israel uh, point of view, uh, the threat of a nuclear Iran uh, to Israel is much greater uh, than increased attacks by Hamas. Israel should be willing to accept uh, a non-nuclear Iran uh, in exchange for increased rocket attacks. The, they're, they're well versed in protecting themselves against those, and a non-nuclear Iran is an exist as they view it as an exis existential uh, threat. Uh, I don't know the exact political uh, domestic political scene in Iran, but it appears tumultuous. What I've seen, there was revolution, uh, attempted revolution recently. Uh, we all saw it. Um, I don't. I can't say much more on that. But yeah, I mean, domestically, politically, obviously, the Iranian regime does still enjoy support. There are still strong support for religious, for religious institutions, and um, the regime does have some legitimacy. At the same time, however, we think that we can tailor a strike such that it's sufficiently surgical to not affect civilian populations, such that in a way, when we publicly broadcast that this is not an attempt at a regime change, it's an attempt to remove the Iranian nuclear program, and more important, that the Iranian regime brought this upon their citizens through a policy of brinkmanship and, um, and aggression, I think the Iranian people will be very open to that. I mean, what the Iranian, pe Iranian people don't want war. They don't, they don't want to be, to be seen as an international pariah. They crave acceptance. So therefore, removing this threat, I think, is much more likely to embolden the Iranian people to step up and remove the current regime rather than drive them closer to it. Well, thank you for a wonderful presentation.